dump bodies. That's Lanaria, what better place? In the wintertime, there's nobody there. Ideal spot to dump a body. It's an odd little crime trend. In the last 22 years, three serial killers have operated on Long Island targeting the same types of victims, prostitutes. It is a weird little serial killer cluster. It is a very weird, spooky thing that's happening. It's as old as Jack the Ripper, who was a serial killer. Not in Long Island, although who knows, because they never caught him. He might have ended up there for a while. Long Island is meant to be New York's playground, a safe haven of beaches and tidy hamlets. Many of the people who live here left New York City years ago for the perceived safety of suburban America. But they're now having to contend with a terrible evil in their midst. They left because of the heroin, or they left because of the crime, and get out there where they think they're sealed off from it, and there's still crime, because one big problem, there's still human beings out there, and there are no perfect human beings, and some of them are really bad. As you know, we uh, commenced the search this morning, a very methodical, careful search, and I'd like to report at this time that we found uh, human remains, three human remains so far in the area between Oak Beach and Gilgo Beach. So far, 10 sets of human remains have been found in this bracken-covered burial ground about an hour's drive from Manhattan. Police fear they may be dealing with not just one, but at least two serial killers. The area in and around Gilgo Beach has been used to discard human remains for some period of time. Four of the murders are thought to be the work of the Long Island Craigslist killer, so-called because his victims were sex workers who advertised on the popular website. Their bodies were all found in Hessian bags. We want to bring to justice this animal that has obviously taken the lives of a number of people. We encourage anyone that has any information to call our hotline, bring this animal to justice. With at least two serial killers on the loose, one of the biggest police searches ever mounted on Long Island is now underway. The county police, the state police, and the FBI are all involved. But in the business of solving crimes, tracking down a serial killer is one of the most difficult tasks to undertake. And while anxious Long Islanders want these murderers caught as soon as possible, it may take months or even years to solve these cases, if indeed they're ever solved at all. All of this sort of started with the disappearance of a prostitute named Shannon Gilbert. She disappeared from a uh, community, a beach community, uh, further up the road. And the police started looking for her and looking for her, either her body or any traces of her. Manny Fernandez has been covering the case for the New York Times. This is actually where they discovered some of the bodies? It is. Yeah, this is it right here. And they've cleared this kind of area that we're standing in. They found that first body. Uh, and then in the days after that, they found three more bodies, all found in burlap sacks, disintegrating burlap sacks. In the hunt for one missing sex worker, police stumbled over the bodies of four others. Given that it is so desolate and out of the way, how difficult has it been for the police in terms of their search? Just how tough is it to find anything here? I think it has been tough. Some of it was found a little bit by luck and a little bit by the noses of the police dogs who have turned some of this stuff up. It's just so hard to even take a step forward. It's so hard to see. They've had to stand in the buckets of fire trucks parked nearby to kind of look over and look down and sort of see if they see anything unusual. It's a very rough terrain. Mm -hmm. 
Shannon Gilbert, the sex worker whose disappearance led police to this field of horrors, has yet to be found, although the worst is feared. In the small, hard scrabble town in New York State where Shannon grew up into a sometimes troubled teenager, her mother Mary's endured a tortuous 12 months, waiting for news about Shannon's whereabouts and her fate. She took the picture and then she had given it to me for Mother's Day 2009. And that was the last Mother's Day you spent with her? That was the last Mother's Day. That was the last Mother's Day. And when we spoke, she was supposed to come down for last year's Mother's Day and have a show. Mother's Day comes around again tomorrow. Yeah, it's going to be sad. It's going to be really sad. But, uh, just hold on to this. And as always, Mother's It's Day. a beautiful photograph. It really is. The last word I said to her was, I want you to be safe. And she says, don't worry, Mommy, I'm always safe. What do you think happened to Shannon? I think someone, or more than one person, um, could have hurt her. Her last phone call was to 911 lasting 23 minutes long, screaming, help me, help me, he's trying to kill me. And the police never, never got there. And they didn't arrive until 45 minutes later after the call, and she was already gone. Shannon Gilbert was last seen in the secluded village of Oak Beach in May of 2010. This is one of the most isolated parts of Long Island, and at night, it's pitch black. Police have interviewed a number of people in the Oak Beach community, including the client Shannon visited that night and the driver who dropped her there. But so far, no arrests have been made. For now, darkness surrounds this case, the very same darkness that allowed this serial killer to go about his gruesome work seemingly undetected. Tracking a serial killer is probably one of the most difficult things a policeman could come upon. He could be still at large, he could kill again, he could be dead, he could be in prison. Who knows? I mean, these bodies have been there for a while. Retired cop Joe Coffey spent more than 20 years patrolling the streets for the NYPD, becoming one of its most celebrated detectives. As well as years of fighting major mob figures, he's best known for his leading role in tracking down the notorious serial killer, Son of Sam. It was the summer of 77, and New York, as Joe Coffey tells it, was going to hell in a handbasket. Well, it was going to hell in a handbasket for a lot of reasons, political reasons, economic reasons. It was the disco era. It was the time when these kids were all involved in drugs. It was that type of atmosphere. Drugs, sex, rock and roll. It was in this cauldron of urban decay and excess that David Berkovitz struck. Dubbed the son of Sam, Berkovitz claimed his neighbor, Sam Carr, had possessed him and ordered his killing spree. It takes a lot of years off your life, believe me. There were no days off. Once we realized it was a serial killer, we formed a task force. And I was put in charge of the nighttime operation, and my job with my team was to catch him in the act and kill him, if we could. He deserved to die, and that was our job, to take him out. So you wanted to kill him? not merely capture him. Absolutely, this is vermin. And we know that you, the nature of our criminal justice system, he never would have got the death penalty. He's still alive. Now he went out and killed six innocent women for no reason. 
The son of Sam's reign of terror in New York City lasted just over a year. The first of the four sex workers discovered in Hessian bags on Long Island went missing as long ago as 2007. How close do you think the police are to solving this crime out on Long Island? They're not close at all. This is suspects around one guy who was the John who actually contracted that girl who ran from the house scream and has been eliminated already. Uh, I don't think they're close at all. She sat there and allowed someone to slit her throat? But many Americans, fed on a diet of cop dramas like CSI, expect a case such as this one to be solved in prime time, not real time. Somebody got to our killers before we did. When it comes to crime, the line between fact and fiction can get very blurred indeed. Perhaps more than any other nation, crime has been woven into the very fabric of the American story through novels, TV, tabloids, and film. I couldn't help myself. I couldn't. And the serial killer Please. is the genre's kingpin. Trust me, I definitely understand. They never lose their fascination. See, I can't help myself either. Here we are 35 some odd years later from the Son of Sam. I'm still getting calls from all over the world to do interviews on the anniversary of the Son of Sam case. Why? It's the human psyche. Curiosity more than fascination. That's what I think. There's a double homicide at the beginning of the book, which in the world of tabloids, a homicide at a good address is the most wonderful story of all. <laughs> when you get two of them, um, stop the press. <laughs> Covered a trial. Pete Hamill is launching his latest novel, Tabloid City, before his devoted hometown audience. A quote from the underwear bomber when he was caught a couple of years ago. He's been writing about New York for 50 years and is the only person to have edited both the Post and the Daily News, the city's two tabloids. And even the criminals you cover as a reporter. The Post and the Daily News were not places where you checked on the status of the sisal crop in Singapore. You didn't do that. It's the accidents and mysteries of a life. The basic great stories were about, were dramatic. Not necessarily melodramatic, where you hype the drama, but they had drama at the heart of it, which meant conflict. There was a good guy and a bad guy. There were things that resembled classic drama. You would find them all the time. Incest, murder, rape, the whole thing that the Greeks found uh, centuries ago. But the drama of crime, as it's presented on the printed page and TV screens, often bears little resemblance to the drudgery and painstaking work of detectives like Joe Coffey. What's it like? I would say hours of boredom interrupted by moments of sheer terror. That's essentially what it is. As for forensic profilers tracking down serial killers in the course of a primetime show... Let me tell you something about profiles. Absolute BS. There's never been a crime in this country solved by a profile. They're always after-the-fact people. They're always super eggheads who think they know all the answers after you catch them. Profilers are full of crap. Okay? Make it very clear. An early trail in the Long Island serial murders case led to nearby New Jersey and one of the most storied cities in the United States. Since its heyday in the 1920s, Atlantic City has been synonymous with gambling, graft, violence, and prostitution. We all have to decide how much sin we can live with. Dramatized in television series like Boardwalk Empire, try as it might, this Sodom and Gomorrah by the sea still can't hide its dark places behind dazzling casino lights. If you look back here down this little alleyway, you'll see the entrance to a 
the Clover Spa. Right. What kind of legitimate business has its entrance in that shady little alleyway there? Alex Siniari is a social worker. Uh... In 2006, one of the women he was counseling was found in a shallow grave on the outskirts of the city, along with three other sex workers. Some people are callous to what these girls are going through out here. So, you know, it's, it's almost like it's a hazardous line of work, and those are some of the inherent risks. It's a twisted thing, man. It's tough. Seemingly the work of a serial killer who has never been caught, at first police thought there might be a link to the Long Island murders. Once these murders in Long Island occurred and the facts started to come out, there was this eerie sense that revisited us and, you know, made us remember, called us back to, uh, to that time in 2006. Those 2006 murders have now joined a lengthy list of unsolved crimes against sex workers in the United States. After the story hits and the sensationalism dies down, you know, law enforcement maybe begins to focus on other things. You know, the leads go cold. No big breaks occur in the case. And they move on. And it kind of reinforces the way that, that these girls feel who are in the life, the hopelessness and the peril that they feel that nobody really does care about what happens to them. Eighteen-year-old Natalie was in the life only for a short time, lured to sex work by her mother, who's been a prostitute since she was 14. They get themselves so deep and wrapped up in it that you can't get out. And if you try to get out, then you're risking your life. How are you risking your life? Who's threatening your life if you try to get out? The pimps. Because the clients, they don't care. They, they just want to have fun for that short amount of time and give you money, but the pimps want you for your money because you're making them a lot of money. They threaten your life, your family, and beat you, drug you. It's not a normal life. It's very, very hard. The police have now discounted a link between the Atlantic City and Long Island serial murders, but both cases graphically underline the dangers sex workers face every day. It's estimated that about 130 female sex workers are murdered each year in the US, and that they're nearly 20 times more likely to suffer such a fate than women in the wider community. She was lured into the idea that you can live a glamorous life, a high life, you could have, you know, clothes and shoes and makeup and jewelry. And they, they showed her the glamorous side and um, not, not the evil side. Mary Gilbert has started a Facebook page where she stays in contact with the families of the young women whose remains were found on Long Island. We speak to each other every day. We support each other every day. And it's a beautiful thing that there's love inside of pain and hurt. But it's also a cruel irony that in this digital age, the very social media they're using to keep in touch also played a role in their daughter's disappearances at the hands of the suspected Long Island Craigslist killer. You know, there should be definite guidelines on what can be put out there and what certain websites and web companies can allow. And I think they should also be held accountable for knowing what is going on and allowing them to do it. In one odd way, this case in Long Island is about another whole category of crime, which is digital-based crime that comes from the web. The uses of 
websites to meet women or pick up prostitutes has been facilitated by the new technology. And that's another whole category of crime that wasn't there 20 years ago. Back on Long Island, police are grappling with a chilling development. It's becoming increasingly clear that this killing ground isn't the province of just one murderer. Another is at work with a very different modus operandi. The bodies of two more women, one of whom has been positively identified as sex worker Jessica Taylor, who disappeared in 2003, weren't found in Hessian bags. Instead, the torsos and heads were ghoulishly separated and scattered kilometers apart. The killer or killers went to extraordinary lengths to prevent the victims from being identified. Another four sets of remains have yet to be identified. And the police are not discounting the astonishing fact that they might be dealing with four murderers in all. They had divers come in, and they did check these little sort of inlets, mm. uh, I think, further in towards where those first four bodies were found. Right. Like everyone else watching this shocking case unfold, reporter Manny Fernandez is asking what sort of person could possibly commit such crimes. One of the experts we talked to said, when he walks into a room, he's probably an average Joe. Um, and that's because a lot of these kind of serial killers who are fairly methodical, and who are uh, very careful about what they do and how they do it. And those are the ones that, you know, are probably maybe the most frightening because they do have a seemingly stable life and they have this Jekyll and Hyde sort of thing where they have a stable life, but they're also out there killing people. I think there's a certain kind of psychopath that blames women, particularly prostitutes, for something, who knows what, and goes out and kills as many of them as he can before they catch him or before he kills himself. It may take a long time to solve these things. See, the thing about serial killers, the thing about uh, assassins, they're kind of the same. Some of them can't be caught unless they hit again. What breaks my heart the most is how, you know, what her emotions were, what her feelings were. 23 minutes screaming to 911, help me, help me. He's trying to kill me, he's after me, help me. She must have really been terrified. Are you still holding out hope that Shannon is alive or do you think that's a very remote possibility? No, I, I believe that she's still out there and she's alive. I have to believe that. You know, I'm not going to give up. We're not going to stop looking and stop searching until she's found. Regardless how long it takes, we're going to keep looking for her.